Morning, boys and girls. How are we doing today? Good. We're almost done with school. Who's done with school already? Uh, me. Oh, you, you guys, you guys are lucky ones. I'm done with school on Tuesday. On Tuesday? I'm done with school. Oh, you guys excited? Okay, cool, cool. Some of you guys get half days. Monday. Half day on Monday. Cool, yeah. guys. But I got half day on Monday and Tuesday. Ooh. All right, boys and girls. We're almost done with the fruit of the Spirit. We've been learning about the fruit of the Spirit in Sunday school, and we only have two left. And so you know the song. We're going to sing it again. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. <laughs> the second last fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. Boys and girls, do you know what the word gentle means? What does gentle mean? When you're careful with something, what are you gentle with? With something fragile. With something glass, you want to be gentle? Something sharp? Oh, certainly you want to be gentle with sharp things. How about other people? Should you be gentle with other people? I got this here. What's this? A rock. A rock. How would it feel if I dropped this on someone's head? That would hurt. It hurt pretty bad. Would that be gentle? No. Pretty scary, right? How about this? That is bad. It's bad, right? What was I going to do if I was to whack someone with this sword? Would that be gentle? No. No, it wouldn't be gentle at all. How about this? What's this? A feather. A feather. How would it feel if I dropped this on her head? That would be... Would it be gentle? Yeah. Boop. It comes me. Did you feel that? Yeah. How about this, boys and girls? So we can be gentle or forceful with objects. How about our voice? If I were to scream at you, would that be gentle? Hello, everybody! Yeah, that's That'd be harsh, right? But if I were to talk very softly with other people, is that gentle? Yes. Boys and girls, what does God want us to do for other people? To be harsh with them or to be gentle? Be gentle. And so we can be gentle not just the way we, we act, but also by what we say. Because when we're gentle with one another, we show that we actually care about each other. No one likes to be yelled at. Do you like to be yelled at? No. No, no one likes to be hit. Do you like to be hit? No. 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 But we are gentle in both what we say and what we do. This is one of the fruit of the Spirit and God loves it when we're gentle with each other. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Remember we pray? Fold our hands. Right, Liam? Close our eyes and you repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring for us. Help us to remember to be gentle with each other in both what we say and what we do. And so love others like you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. And in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, boys and girls, we'll see you after Sunday school. You want Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I live in a world surrounded by people who are obsessed with success. People who so often compare themselves to each other to see who is superior. Who has made it in life and who has not. You know it. This attitude is everywhere. And people like this, they ask these kinds of questions. They ask, is my car the nicest one on the block? Do I have a bigger house than my next door neighbor? Are there more gold coins in my coffers? 
Have I had more success in relationships? Do I have a better physical appearance than other people? Do I have more followers on social media? This is a comparison catastrophe, and it's everywhere. But it's not God's will for us. Sometimes this attitude even rears its ugly head in the church. When the, char- the church starts viewing success like the world does and saying, well, a successful church, it comes down to the numbers. The most successful church has the most butts in seats. The most successful church has the most funding, the most charismatic pastor, the most property, the most youth programs. But is this true? God's idea of success sometimes is counterintuitive to what we might know. So this is a good question for us. What's God's view of a successful life? What does God mean when a church has success? Well, it's certainly not the view I just pushed on you, this idea that we should be striving after worldly goods and fame. When we take that attitude, God looks at us in a certain way. He looks at us like this. What is this? A carrot, and not just a carrot, but a carrot on a stick. Maybe you're familiar with this illustration when someone gets on the back of a donkey and sticks the stick out with the carrot. And what happens? The donkey sees the carrot and does what? He walks forward because he thinks if he walks forward, he'll get close to the carrot. But a phenomenon happens. Somehow, he does not get close to the carrot. It's the same distance away. And yet he keeps on walking with this feigned hope that he will one day get the carrots. It's meaningless. There's no end. There's no hope. In the same way, when we try to find true happiness in this life, it's like we're seeking after a carrot on a stick. We will never get there. Oh, do whatever it takes to make you feel happy. Just following the the carrot on a stick. Jesus himself tells a story just like this. Maybe you've heard this parable. It's the parable of the man who builds bigger and bigger barns. The man, he is a successful businessman. He has made it in life. Huge farming business with barns, but he decides, you know what? Enough is not enough. I want to keep going. I want more success, more happiness. So he decides to expand his business and tear down his barns and hire more employees and gain more wealth for himself. And so he fills up his barns and decides that's not enough either. So he continues to tear down barns and boost himself up to try to find some sort of happiness. And what does God say? You fool, today your soul is required of you. What does that mean for us as Christians? It means no one's going to care what kind of car you drive when you're in heaven. No one's going to care how much wealth you have when you're in heaven or lack of wealth. Rather, God's idea of success is very different than ours. Let me ask you, what do you think God loves more? The fact that Graceland Church is a nice little piece of property? Or the fact that Al, your granddaughter, little Valentina, came up to me at the end of last week's service and told me all the fruit of the Spirit by heart? Yes. Yes. What do you think God loves more? I think the truth. The truth that comes from our God. The truth in Jesus. You see, uh, what's a successful church look, what does a successful church look like? It's not about the number of butts in seats. It's about are we preaching and teaching the truth of our Lord Jesus. And when we free ourselves from this rat race, trying to collect worldly goods and fame for ourselves, we see how important what God gives is for us. This is why it's so awesome. I love talking to people who have made a complete mess of their lives. Because they know this truth. They know life cannot give me that eternal happiness I'm looking for. But it comes 
in the hands and arms of Jesus. Jesus for us. So let me wrap up the sermon. I want to read real quick the counterintuitive, countercultural idea of happiness and success that comes from our God. It comes from our epistle lesson. Paul writes on it at the end of our epistle lesson, at the end of that second paragraph. Paul writes, We are treated as impostors and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As punished and yet not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing yet possessing everything. How could that be possible? To have nothing yet possess everything? It's possible because you and I follow the God who can calm the sea. You and I follow the God who, without his permission, not a single raindrop touches the ground. Do you think that God has a plan for you? That God cares for you? That God knows what you need? So what's the moral of the story? Moral of this sermon? It's not that you, don't have to, you can't enjoy your car. It's not to stop paying your bills because this life doesn't matter. Right, please pay your bills. But rather, don't be filled with anxiety and worry in the comparison game or feel like you are not good enough. Because don't forget, brothers and sisters, you have already made it in life. When you were baptized and Christ claimed you as his own. You are God's. And this is what true success looks like. Not what we can achieve ourselves, but what our God so graciously gives to us. Eternal life to come. His holy and precious name. Amen.